Friday night, we had uh, our Moving Mountains healing heart journey start with hearing the voice of God. And uh, I was just hoping one or two people can come up and uh, kind of give a testimony, not read like we did Friday night, but just kind of give a testimony of what happened. If you got touched Friday night, something happened, come now. I want you to give a testimony. Give glory to God. What happened? There's one. Give me one more. Here we go. One more. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, we got two. Come on. The ladies are the courage, courageous ones today. Hello, I'm Kelly. So Friday night Hello. was just amazing. I felt like I always had a hard time like listening to God or I would be like, am I really listening to God? And it was just so practical and simple and it just shows like how much God really wants to talk to us. Yes. So yes. Friday night, I just went in the back and I was like, God, just, just speak, whatever it is. And his love just poured out. And I wrote like a long page, but it was just the most beautiful Come on. letter to a daughter that I've ever received in my life. So I felt breakthrough and just love and a new identity was definitely placed over me. So you guys should definitely Amen. try it out. Amen. <laughs> Come on, give it up for Kelly, everybody. Give it up for Kelly, everybody. Say hi, hi. to Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hello. Um, I really got touched Friday night. Um, the minute I started writing on my paper, God was just really speaking personal things to me, like, the entire night. Um, and then even afterwards, I just, I was on the ground, and I was just experiencing the presence of God, and just, God was just ministering his love over me, and just speaking just value into wow. my into my heart and how much he sees me as worthy and and valuable to him and just and just how he sees me as his precious daughter and it was just something I just really needed and he's just so beautiful and he really meets you exactly where you're at come on why don't you pray for the people right now Pray they will receive the same. Pray Father, in the name place. of Jesus, I just pray right now that you would just speak your value over people, Father, that you would just Hallelujah. instill in people's hearts right now, God, Hallelujah. the value and how you see them, Jesus. I thank you that you just pour out your love, that you just inject a heart filling love, Father, into people right now, Jesus, that people would see their worth, God and how you see them, and how you love them. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Give it up for Sarah, everybody. Yeah. Hallelujah. Give it up for Mike. Thanks, Mike. Woo. Hallelujah. If you've got a Bible, go ahead and turn to John, excuse me, Luke chapter 24. I'm going to get there in a little bit. We are in our... Spiritual Revival Message Series. I'm going to need a prayer team. Y'all going to distract me. I'll be watching y'all the whole time, so you got to be quiet. I love you guys, though. See, I'll see the anointing moving over there. I'll get distracted the whole time. <coughs> you guys feeling good today? Yeah. <coughs> I, uh, <clears throat> I, want to, I, want to, I want to talk to you today. Um, I want to teach, I want to teach uh, more than I normally do. Because I want, to, um, I want to lay some groundwork, some biblical groundwork of where we're going in the next season. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> so uh, there's going to be less of a preach, more of a teach. If you like uh, Bible teaching, which I hope you do, uh, you're going to enjoy this. Um, uh, and then I believe God's going to move at the end. Amen? Amen. I believe by faith he'll move the whole time. Amen. Hallelujah. God has been very good. He's been moving in our midst. Pretty excited about it. I want to show you a desk. That's a desk. I have a desk. Do you have a desk? I have a desk in my office. I have a desk at home. I have two desks. That's how I am. That's how I'm balling these days. <laughs> two desks. And uh, if you receive that desk, it'd be nice. Nice desk. Looks old. Of course, uh, those of you who are uh, fans of West Wing know that is the Resolute Desk. It is in the Oval Office of the White House right now. It's not always in the Oval Office. The president picks their own desk. They the president, and they can pretty much do whatever they want in their office, right? And so there's different desks that you use from time to time. And uh, to receive a nice desk would be one thing. To receive a desk that the president owned 
That'd be pretty good too, right? One that he used in the Oval Office, that, that would be cool. Uh, but if you didn't fully understand the history of this desk, you wouldn't fully appreciate the gift that it would be. So like I said, this is called the Resolute Desk. Now, in 1845, Sir John Franklin left Great Britain in search of the Northwest Passage. Now, what that meant was they were looking for a way to get to China over North America. Now, if you've ever looked on a map, above the United States is Canada. That's right. Canada is above the United States, and it's a very large country, right? We don't know anything about it because we're Americans, but it's there, right? Now, <clears throat> above Canada, if you've looked on the map, if you've looked on the map, above Canada is ice. Yes. Now, they didn't know that, and they were looking for a passage through uh, north, the Northwest Passage to get to uh, China without having to go the other way. And so they sent a boat with Sir John Franklin uh, in 1845 to go look for this passage, and uh, and uh, he, they just kind of lost track of him. So between 1848 and 1850, uh, Great Britain uh, bought and commissioned some ships, and they sent them out uh, to go look for Sir John Franklin. Now, some of those guys didn't find other thing, anything. Some guys uh, found a uh, remnant of a camp of John Franklin. Some people found, watch this, ice, right? And so they got trapped in the ice while looking for John Franklin, who we're pretty sure got trapped in the ice, right? And so one of the ships, they went back to Great Britain, and the, they, many people gave up. But one guy said, no, I know Sir John Franklin. I really want him found. And he spent his own money uh, to commission ships to go look for him. And then eventually, Great Britain sent some ships again to go look for him. One of them was the Resolute. And the Resolute went and looked for Sir John Franklin, and they didn't find him at all, but they did find one of the other ships who were looking for him, trapped in the ice, and the crew had been there, I believe, almost a year, trapped on the ice, uh, waiting to get free. Uh, the Resolute found them, brought them on board their ship in order to bring them back to England, uh, when the Resolute itself got trapped in the ice. There's a pattern here, right? Now, back then, you get trapped in the ice, it's not like you're sending a message to anybody. There you are, right? And so they're in the ice, they're trapped in the ice, and they were charting their, path, their, their course, and uh, they were moving at a staggering pace of 1.7 nautical miles per day, right? Not per hour. If you're going 60 miles an hour, that means you're going a mile every minute, one mile per day. And uh, after several months of this, uh, they went through um, from, from the fall, they got trapped Come spring, they were still on the ice cap, trapped in their boat because of the ice flow. They decided, okay, we're not getting anywhere. It's time to abandon ship. So they locked up their ship, and they set out on the ice to go hike to where they knew uh, that there was a base where they could uh, be rescued. And so sure enough, they set out, got on the ice, they began walking, and after several months, them and several other ships over the uh, period of four months, these crews uh, met at this um, station uh, where a ship from Great Britain was waiting, uh, a couple more showed up, and they sailed back to England. And uh, that was in uh, November of 1854. So in 1853, they were trapped. 1854, they left. Can you imagine sitting on a boat with your co-workers for six months? That's a good time right there, right? I <clears throat> hope you like who you work with. So they left in 1840, 1855, excuse me, 1854, they went back to England. In 1855, there was a fisherman from Connecticut who was up in the northern area, and he saw a boat floating all on its own. Uh, he sent his crew on board. They found it. Of course, it was the Resolute. The Resolute had been freed from the ice and was floating free. Uh, and this was a full year after the crew had abandoned it. Uh, he sent half his crew on that boat, and they sailed it back to Connecticut, where the United States bought it from the man, spent $40,000 refurbishing it, and sailed it back to uh, Britain as a uh, uh, act of goodwill. Now, Great Britain used this boat for several more years, and eventually they decommissioned it. And when they decommissioned it, uh, Queen Victoria uh, decided out of, you know, when they decommissioned a ship, this lumber was precious, it's a, you know, it's valuable, they could build other stuff with it. 
Queen Victoria decided, I want to make three desks from it. One of them was a writing table that she commissioned for herself and is still in uh, the palace today. The second one was a smaller desk for a woman, and it was for the widow of the man who paid to send crews to look for Sir John Franklin as a thank you gift to this woman. And a third one was a gift to the United States, uh, thanking them for returning the Resolute and their support in looking for Sir John Franklin. He gave this, this desk to um, uh, President Rutherford B. Hayes, who used it in his office, the Resolute desk. Now, Rutherford B. Hayes used this and several presidents after him, and when uh, Jacqueline Kennedy uh, came to the White House with John F. Kennedy, she found the desk in kind of disrepair, not being used. She had it completely refurbished and, uh, uh, and, and, and restored, and it, brought, it was in the White House with uh, John F. Kennedy in the Oval Office. And you may have seen a very famous picture of John F. Kennedy's son kind of coming out where that uh, U.S. Or the presidential seal is right there. There's a little door, and there's a famous picture of his son kind of poking his head through that door. Uh, while John F. Kennedy is looking at him. Now, that door was installed not originally, but when uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was president, he, of course, had, he had suffered polio and was crippled, and he didn't want people to see his crutches or his leg braces, so he had that presidential seal made and put there. And now, by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have vaccines so our children don't get polio. Can you say, thank you, Jesus? Amen. Thank you for the grace of God that we can vaccinate our children to not get polio. So Jacqueline Kennedy had it restored, had it brought into the Oval Office, and when uh, President Kennedy was unfortunately assassinated, the desk went on tour as part of a presidential library. When Jimmy Carter became president, he decided, I want that desk back in the White House to where it's been used by every president in one form or another since then. Now, with that, what we call the history of this desk, or we'll call it the provenance, that makes this desk that much more valuable. Would you agree? Because of the story involved and the history involved and the people that's touched it, it's, it's more valuable than just an old desk. Now, it's a neat looking desk and I'd love to have it as it is, but I would love to have a presidential desk. That would be pretty neat. And each president has several desks because they have an office here, there, and everywhere. And uh, I would like to have a presidential pen. I'd like to have anything from the president. I don't care who the president is. If I like him or not, I'd like to have something from him, right? So that would be, that would be pretty neat. But once we find out the provenance of it, it's that much more valuable. And if we received it as a gift, it would be literally priceless. Would you agree with me? Yeah. Amen. So what we see when we read the New Testament, we see that there's, there's provenance to many of the promises God gives us that we don't know. We don't know the history and the significance and how this is so much bigger than just what we have experience it to be thus far. There's so many things that God promised, that Jesus promises us in the New Testament, that we don't really understand what a big deal this is. If you give this to the wrong person, it's just wood. You give it to the right person, it is a priceless artifact from two major nations. Amen? The wood is 160 years old, 170 years old at least. It's priceless. So with that in mind, let's open the Bible and let's take a little Look, see here, shall we? Luke chapter 24, verse 49. This is Jesus who had, uh, who had uh, been crucified and resurrected, and he was talking to his disciples. And he says to his disciples, And behold, I'm sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. If you're taking notes today, the title of my message is Clothed with power. Can you say amen? amen? Clothed with power. Clothed with power. Now, <clears throat> in order to understand the provenance or the history of this scripture, we're going to have to go back in time a little bit and, and get a running start as to what God is talking about here. Let's go all the way back to the Exodus. You remember the Exodus, of course, when the Jews were in bondage, they were in slavery and uh, in, to Egypt, and God raised up Moses, and Moses led the children out of bondage. And we see how God walked with Moses to lead the people out of bondage. And we know that when they were in the, the uh, desert, Holy Spirit manifested as smoke and as fire. 
to lead the people as they were traveling, to give them direction, to give them um, a sense of assurance on where they're supposed to be going. And after time, uh, we know there's, there's various debates on how many people were in the desert there with Moses. I, I've heard as, as, as few as uh, 750,000. Other people say there's well over a million. But either way, uh, if you are a, a, an overseer at your job, three people leading is a lot. If you have four people that you're leading at a job, that feels like a lot. Can you say amen? Those supervisors know what I'm talking about. If you've got a dozen people under you, you better have somebody in between you and them to help lead the group, right? Yeah. Now imagine you had 750,000 people. <laughs> and the leadership structure looked like this. You, 750,000 people. That would be complicated. And so Moses, with his brilliance, said to God, and that's where all great thoughts come from. Someone talked to God. Moses talked to God and said, like, you know, this... This is getting to be a bit much. The anointing is on me. However, this is getting to be a bit much. And so in his complaining, God told him, he said, listen, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get 70 of your elders. That tells me there were way more elders than 70. But God told Moses, pick 70 that you like, right? Pick 70 people that you like. That's who you're going to be working with. Pick 70 of your elders and get them together. And then in Numbers chapter 11, verse 17 he tells him this. He says, then I, God, right? We, we, we kind of dumb down some of these things. This is what God says to Moses. Then I, God says this to Moses. Then I, God, will come down and speak with you there. I, that, that for me is like, okay, that, that'd be it. I wouldn't need anything else after that. <laughs> Just come down and speak to me here and I'm good, right? He says, then I, God, will come down and speak to you there. And I will take of the Spirit who is, look at this, upon you, and will put him upon them. Now, I want you to see the Trinitarian unfolding already in this passage of Scripture, right? Let's look at this. God, the Father, says, I will come down and speak with you there, and I will take of the, say it, who is upon you, and I will put it, him, him, the Holy Spirit. I will put him upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with you, so that you, ha, huh, mm, yeah. woo, so, mm, yeah, yeah, mm, mm, mm. hallelujah, all righty, ha, huh, this could take a minute, mm. so that, you, mm, so that you will not, mm, bear it all, ha, huh. Alone. Wow. All righty. Ah, that's what's happening now. Yes. I would um, encourage you to be aware of the transformative power of the Holy Spirit that's in this room. I would just attune into His transformative presence. Because what I'm saying is pretty good. Encountering Him would be better. Now, if you can do both, you're an all-star. So we know that the Holy Spirit was upon Moses for him to lead. The Scripture here makes it very clear that he was leading by the power of the Holy Spirit upon him. And so God took a portion of the Spirit, not all of it, but God came and took a portion of the Spirit that was upon Moses and put it upon the 70 elders so they could lead with Moses, right? Later on, as uh, they got to the edge of Canaan, uh, Moses was told, hey, um, take a look, but you're not going in. It's time to raise up somebody else. And so God told Moses to raise up Joshua. And he tells him uh, that you are to anoint Joshua. And we read about this in Numbers 27.20. In Numbers 27.20, God says to Moses, and again, I would sure love to be able to talk as decisively about God talking to me as Moses. You shall put some of your authority on him in order that all the congregation of the sons of Israel may obey him. Now you see your authority is highlighted there because I feel like sometimes the translators of the Bible are scared of God and scared of being as clear about what God is saying as what he is actually saying. Let's take a look-see here. 
your authority. The word there, authority, next slide please, in Hebrew is called hod. That word is hod. Look it up when you get home. If you can read Hebrew on the left there that says hod, I'm guessing almost none of you do. So that could literally mean Kung Pao chicken. You just don't know. I doubt it says that. I believe it says hod. So the word there says hod, and hod is translated to mean glory, honor, majesty. Glory, honor, majesty. Hod. So if you were to look at how this word is used in other places in Scripture, Psalm 148.13 says this, Let them praise the name of the Lord, for His name alone is exalted. His hod is above the earth and heaven. His hod, His glory is above the earth and in heaven. If we look at 1 Chronicles chapter 16, we see hold and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are his place. Hold, splendor, the splendor of God. So if we look back at, no, at Numbers chapter 27, verse 20, understanding what hold is. No, go forward, not backwards. If we go to Numbers 27, 20, go forward. There you go. He says, you shall put some of your hode. You shall put some of the splendor, majesty, glory of God that is on you, on him, in order that the congregation of the sons of Israel may obey him. The hode that is upon you. Literally, the anointing, Holy Spirit that is on him. That is the glory in honor, in majesty of God that was upon Moses. And that anointing, that glory, that majesty, that honor that was on him gave him authority to lead. He says, now that glory, honor, majesty that I've put upon you, I want you to put it on Joshua so that he may have authority to lead. Do you, do you, do you see this? The presence of God then came upon Joshua and he led them into the promised land. That was after the hode, the glory, honor, magic, this Holy Spirit, the anointing came upon Joshua. Do you see this pattern? Do you see the pattern? Yes, I do, Pastor Carl. Thank you so much. Absolutely, I see that. Thank you for pointing that out. So as time went on, they weren't, as time went on, the anointing was not enough for them. They wanted to be like all the other churches. Excuse me. They wanted to be like all the other kingdoms and have a flashy king. And so, <clears throat> and so God said, if that's what you really want, I'll give you a king. And so God chose a man named Saul. Now, the prophet Saul found Sam. Excuse me. The prophet Saul found, prophet Samuel found Saul wandering around. What was Saul doing? Well, Saul's dad had some donkeys that were free. And this man who's called to greatness was taking care of his dad's donkeys. He was looking for them that were lost. He was looking for what his father owned and bringing it back home. I'm here to let you know that you do not need to build your own ministry. You don't need to worry about God taking care of you. You don't have to go out there and market yourself. You don't need a YouTube channel. You don't need your own t-shirts. Jesus knows how to find you. Jesus knows how to send a prophet to find you in your timing. Can you, do you hear me? You do not need to worry about that. God is not confused about how he's going to put you in what your calling is. Your job is to stay faithful where God has you. And as it were, uh, S S uh, Saul was out wandering, looking for his father's donkeys. And I want you to see this. He never did find them. He was actually failing in the task he was being faithful at. If I succeed at this, then God is going to do that. No, just be faithful where God has you. So he was faithful to the task at hand. He was out looking for the donkeys and, uh, and, and, and saying, that's a good word right there. First service didn't get that. That's good right there. <laughs> so the prophet finds him, and he dumps a horn of oil on his head. Now, it wasn't like today where everybody calls himself a prophet or an apostle. 
The church is filled with apostles today. It's funny. We don't, we don't even have any saints anymore. Everybody's a prophet or an apostle. It's amazing. It's just amazing. I'm, I'm, okay, my wife's looking at me. All right. I say that sarcastically, backslash S, right? <clears throat> Nobody wants to be a saint. Baba. So he's looking for the donkeys. The, the, the prophet comes and pours oil on his head. And the prophet tells him a couple things. He says, he says, hey, your donkeys have been found, right? Your donkeys have been found. They're taken care of. Don't worry about it. Then he said, there's some people who are going up to Bethel. They're bringing food. They're going to give to you. One of the indicators that you're coming into your time of calling is financial prosperity, I have seen. It doesn't require financial prosperity. But I see when the anointing lands, things start to shift in your finances. They shift in your relationships. They shift in your finances. So he says, you're going to get some, uh, so you're going to get, they're going to give some of that food to you that they're bringing to God. And the third thing uh, he says is, there's going to be a bunch of prophets coming along. He says this, uh, he says, there's going to be some uh, prophets coming along. And in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 6, he says, Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you mightily. Now, I'd be happy it would just come upon me. <laughs> this is God saying this. Like, that means he can put it on you or put it on you mightily. I'm going for mightily. How about you? Like, put it on me. Come on. I'm ready. I'm ready. Put it on me. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you mightily, and you shall prophesy with them and be changed into another man. Now, I want you to see how we're seeing the progression of the revealing of the ministry of the Spirit of God through Scripture. Now, before, uh, we saw that God just spoke to man. Then we saw God put His presence upon men, His hode, and they walked in authority. Now we see that the Spirit will come upon people and they will be changed into another man. Now, let me say this. Uh, we believe that He'll change you into another man or a woman. You'll stay what you started though, right? So He will change you. We're just not that progressive. We're just, he's just, he's going to you're going to stay what you were, but another one of you, but a better one, right? You'll be changed into a better version. Right? Amen? Yes. Hallelujah. But this is the promise of God then and for you. Amen? And so the anointing comes upon him and transforms him. We didn't, he didn't say, I'm going to send a discipleship program. He didn't say that you're going to study and walk around a thing three times or you're going to, he says, no, the spirit will come upon you and change you. Shabbat, that's a good word right there. And so we find in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 10, when they came to the hill there that he said the prophets will be walking up, behold, hey, guess what? That's what the behold there means. Hey, guess what? A group of prophets met him and the spirit of God came upon him mightily so that he prophesied among them. Do you see this pattern of when the Spirit of God comes upon people in the Hebrew Bible? We, we, we see here is, we see that, um, Abba. we see what happened with David. We see what happened with Saul. The anointing comes upon him. We see in the New Covenant what happened with Paul. And the anointing came upon him and changed him. We see it here with Saul. The anointing gave him the ability to complete the God task. The anointing came upon him to complete his God task, but it wasn't just an anointing that came upon him. The anointing came on him and produced a sign that others would see he was called by God. There's two things we see that happens when the anointing comes upon someone. Number one, there is an experiential encounter with God. There's an experience, meaning you experience it. It's not just mental ascent. It's not just, oh, let me just convince you that you're filled. Let me just convince you that you're saved. If someone has to convince you that you're saved, it's probably time to get saved. If someone has to convince you that you're filled, hey, guess what? It's time to get refilled. There's an experience. Like, I got married, and no one needs to convince me that I'm married. 
There's an experience with getting married to let you know you're married, right? Like there's, there, you experience marriage, you experience relationship. You have an experience that happens internally to confirm to you, God has done this thing in my life. But there's a second component. There's a public manifestation that tells the world that you have been anointed to do this task. Amen. That you now have authority to do it. There is an internal experiential confirmation and then there is an anointing that comes upon you to let the world know that you are ready for this task. So this, this narrative shows us time and again, time and again, that experientially we receive something from God and we know God has touched us. But God publicly demonstrates it to the nation. He publicly demonstrated to the nation that Saul was now anointed to lead because he was prophesying with the prophets. Saul knew that he was anointed to do it because God had spoken with him. The anointing came upon him, and he was changed into a different man. Does this make sense to you? Does this make sense? Amen. So as time comes on, there's a man named John the Baptist comes along. John the Baptist, uh, he's a baller, right? Like this man, John the Baptist was the man, right? And uh, John the Baptist is, uh, is, is walking with God, and uh, he's doing his thing, and, uh, and, and, and he sees Jesus, and he prophesies about Jesus. Now, Moses, Moses ushered in the conquest ministry of Joshua, right? Moses walked with God, and then he passed it on to Joshua, and Joshua brought Israel into the conquest, brought them into freedom, brought them in and conquered the land. Now, John ushered in the conquest ministry of Jesus. John walked with God, but he did not have that anointing that he would transfer on. Are you, are, are you with me here? Yeah. Right? So John walked with God. He was anointed, but he, 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 he ushered in Jesus's conquest ministry. Now, when, G, when John saw Jesus, he said to him, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus came to John and said, it's, it's important that you baptize me. And John said, what? Baptize you? That's crazy. Why did John need to baptize Jesus? Well, here's what I want to let you know. Jesus walked the earth uh, before he came from heaven. He laid down his divinity. He walked, that's called the, the, the kenosis. The kenosis is the, the, the theological term of Jesus setting aside his divinity while he was on the earth. Say, while he's on the earth. Wow. While he was on the earth, he laid down his divinity. And so he walked the earth as a man attuned to God, but he had not been anointed to walk on the earth as the Messiah. John the Baptist was prophesying about who his call was. Here is the Lamb of God who will take away the sin of the world. But he was not anointed to do that yet. Jesus said, you have to baptize me. John said, baptize you. You're the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What are you talking about? Jesus said, it has, everything has to be done in order. And so John, like every good Christ follower, listens to Jesus, <laughs> even when it sounds stupid. And he baptized him. In Luke 3, 22, we see he gets baptized. And he says, and watch the pattern here. This Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. A dove didn't land on him. Holy Spirit landed on him like a dove. And a voice came of heaven, out of heaven. You are my beloved son. In you, I am well pleased. Now, now he has been clothed. Now the anointing has come upon him. Like every other great prophet, of old. Was Jesus a prophet? Absolutely he was a prophet, but much more because he was God. Amen? Yeah. Still is. Amen. And so watch what happens now. As we look in uh, Luke chapter 4 verse 1, Jesus, full of the Spirit, full of Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now this is, now we're seeing something new. Now we see Jesus full of of the Spirit. Now, the fullness of Holy Spirit was in Jesus and upon Jesus. The fullness of Holy Spirit was in Jesus and upon Jesus. He bore the fullness. I'm saying that over and over for a reason. Before this, people got a measure of the anointing. Jesus got all of it. Amen. Hear me. He got all of it. 
He walked in all of it. So now Holy Spirit is ministering in fullness on the earth upon Jesus Christ and in him. And Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness. Now, he is now the anointed one. He bore the Spirit. He is now the Christ. Do you understand that? Well, he always was a Christ. Yes, yes, I get that. But there was a moment in time that Jesus chose to step into that we got to see when it happened. We get a date for it. God doesn't need a date. All right? We walking on the same page here? All right, good. So Jesus received ability and authority when he received the Spirit. Up till then, the Bible says he had done no miracles. So he, had, he grew in, in, in grace and wisdom, uh, in favor and wisdom, but he had not received the anointing. Are, are you guys tracking with me? Are, we, are you seeing the pattern here? Are we, are you enjoying yourself at all? I want you to enjoy yourself. I want you to have a good time here at church. It's, gotta be, it's important. So Jesus was led out into the wilderness, full of the Holy Spirit. Hear me, full of the Holy Spirit. He's led out into the wilderness where he's tempted by the devil. He goes into the wilderness and he defeats the devil. He defeats the enemy in the wilderness. Now, so many times people go through a dry season and they complain about it. It's the dry season where you defeat the devils in your life. It's not on the mountaintop. Like Friday night, people heard God's voice, and that is, oh my gosh. Like, we set that up on purpose because it's so, so important. But you need to carry that into the dry season when he's not saying that, and then you have to say it. That's when the anointing walks through you. Now, don't tell us about what, you know, who you are when you're on the mountaintop. Don't tell me about who you are in the worship service or when people are looking and you got the anointing flowing on. You know, tell me who you are when things look barren, when things look defeated, when things look empty, because that's where you defeat the devil. That is where you defeat the devil. That is where the devils fall in your life. That is where the problem, that's where you break through right there in the dry season. And you might be deceived, and the American church is telling us that we get to live in victory and live in breakthrough and live in prosperity and live in just like we're always going to have an amazing time with all our family and everybody's going to love us and I don't have to go through any persecution. I get to keep everybody away from me who doesn't look like me and I just get to, I just get to be amazing all the time. And it's just not scriptural Christianity. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes Jesus wants to get you alone with the devil so you can kick him in the mouth. It's the dry season where it's not when Jesus is upon you, it's who's Jesus in you, and you give him a voice when you're face to face with the enemy in the dry place. Man, if you're in a rough place right now, praise God. Quit trying to run from it. Kick some devils in the mouth. Start speaking what God told you on the mountaintop. What did he tell you to write in that journal? You better be reading it, memorize it, speak it to the devil when you don't think God is around because he's still in you. You are still filled with the Spirit in those moments, and that's when you need to use it. Amen? Amen. Come on. That's when we need to use it. That's when you get authority right there. And so Jesus took this anointing that was upon him, went into the desert, defeated the enemy, resisted every temptation, and what did Jesus use? He used the Scriptures. Now, you don't have to use the scriptures. Don't throw Bible at me. Don't. You use your testimony. The word is the testimony of Jesus Christ, right? So he's using the, he's using the word because it is the word. That's what's in him. That's what's in him. Right? What's in you? What has Christ put in you? He put it in you for a reason. Remember we talked last week or week before, God never butt dials, right? Like he called you on purpose. He told you something on purpose. Like you're probably going to need those words. Probably going to need those words. And so we drag those words into the dry place. And when the enemy comes, we get what God put in us and we speak it out and we defeat the enemy in the dry season. Amen? Are you with me? This is what Jesus did. And, and then we see uh, the next thing we hear about him in Luke chapter 9, excuse me, in Luke chapter 4, verse 14, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through all the surrounding districts. I want to show you again the same pattern. Jesus had an experience with Holy Spirit to let him know that he was anointed, that God had done something in his life, and then he did something public to let the world know he had authority 
over the enemy. Look at this. He returned in the power of the Spirit. That was the encounter. That was the anointing that he received. And news about him spread. That is the public display that is now letting folks know this man is anointed, that the anointing of God is upon this man. Do you see this pattern? You see this pattern. The anointing comes for you to experience God, and then God will do something public for others to know. Okay, you see this, yes? And so in Luke chapter 9, verse 1, Jesus got some disciples, and uh, he calls them together. And then look what he does here. He gives them very specific anointing. He calls them together, and he gave the 12, he gave them power and authority, not all power, not all authority. He gave them power and authority over all the demons and to heal diseases. They had a very specific anointing on their life. Now, before I move on, I just want to touch on something very quickly. How many demons did he give authority over? How many? When the anointing is upon you, you have authority over all demons. All demons. You don't get less than the apostles. All demons. Now, there are deliverance ministries that want to have conversations with the demons, want to have tea and find out their names and their histories and all that. Like, I'm just like, if you're a devil, I don't care which one you are because I have authority over all of them. It's not like, you know, I'm a BMW mechanic and you got a Ford and I can't really help out. No, no, no. I have authority over them all. Over them all. Was that a demon? I got authority over it. I'm going now make it leap. I don't look for demons. I don't go demon hunting. But if I see one, I shoot it. I don't go hunting for demons. I don't look for them. I don't dig around in your life. I don't dig around in my life. I don't pick up. Oh, I wonder if there's a demon over here. No, no, no. But when one shows up, it's going down. Amen? Are you with me? That's just... Right? And so Jesus... Gave them power and authority over demons and to heal diseases. And then he gave them some very, very specific instructions. And here's what happens. Here's what we do. This is, this, is, this is what we do. God tells us to do something, and we start figuring out how God's going to do it. We start coming up with task lists. We start coming up with what God's got to accomplish in order for this to happen. It's got to happen this way and this timing, and i got to get this financial thing together, and i got to get these people together. Oh, better get some supporters. Better, better get this and that and the other. And Jesus, Jesus knows us, right? He knows that people do that. And he's like, listen, I'm sending you out. No, no, don't pack extra clothes. No, 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 don't worry about where you're going to stay. Don't put your task list together. I want you to actually, now this is going to be hard for you, trust the anointing I just put upon you. I want you to actually trust God. I want you to actually, watch this, trust God. That's what he's still telling disciples today. You have to actually trust God, right? You have to actually trust him. And so he's like, listen, I just want you to trust me because I know what I'm doing. I know the spirit that I've put upon you. I'm sending you guys out and don't do all this nonsense, right? Wherever you wind up, eat there. If they don't want what you got, move on. Like, just don't overcomplicate things, right? right? And so he sends them out. And uh, verse 6, we're going to skip forward a little bit. In verse 6, he says, In departing, they began going through the villages, watch this, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. The healing that they were doing were people experiencing God. Preaching the gospel was the public display that they were anointed for this ministry. Do you see this? There's always the two that we see from Old Covenant right into new. It's always the same. When God anoints you, he does something internally and externally. Amen? And so we see it here with the disciples. The anointing gave them power, gave them power, and the anointing gave others a sign that God was with them, that their message was true. Are, Are you seeing this? I hope you're seeing this. This is good stuff. So let's get back with all that provenance. With all that history, with all that background, now that we've understood the story of the resolute, as it were, as, as, as how we get to this scripture, let's go back to Luke 24, 49, and let's take a look again. Knowing what we learned about Saul, knowing what we know about Joshua, knowing what we know about Jesus, Jesus now has been crucified, is getting ready to go into heaven where he will not need Holy Spirit any longer. He will pick his divinity back up. He will fully walk in it there. He says, and behold, I'm sending forth the promise of my Father upon 
you. I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you. Just like it came on David. Just, they, knew the, they knew the history. They knew the provenance. They didn't need this explained to them. Just like it came on Joshua. Just like it came on Isaiah. Just like Ezekiel. I'm sending it upon you. But stay until you're clothed with power from on high. What does that mean? Stay until you experience it. Stick around because you'll know when it happens. You're not going to have a Bible study where someone tells you, no, 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 right here it says you're already filled. No, no, you already experienced it when you said that one thing 20 years ago. No, 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 that's it. That's the experience you said it. No, no, no. He's like, you, you'll know when it happens. Because you're going to experience it, right? But they didn't see the pattern that there was a second part to it. Not just their experience. There was more to it. But Jesus promised them that they would be clothed with power. So, Acts chapter 2, they obeyed Jesus, which every smart Christian should do. And it says, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were, all, woo, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, say suddenly. Suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves. And they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. You think they knew something was happening. You think they knew they were experiencing God. Like, maybe this is what Jesus was talking about. I'm speaking in a language I don't know, and the fire of God is all over us. We're uncontrollably praising God in unknown languages. There's fire everywhere. It was so powerful and so impactful they poured out of that room i believe even unconsciously and they were in the streets praising god and now watch what happens they're in the streets and now their personal experience became a public display that they had been anointed by god do you see this it was a public display that they had been anointed by God. And some people believe the word that they had been speaking in that unknown tongue. They saw the experience as a sign that they were appointed by God. And when they believed, the Bible says, 3,000 of them were saved. They had, watch this, their own experience based on the testimony of those other people who were sharing their experience. Do you see this? Hear me. The promise of Pentecost is that we can live clothed with power. Watch this. You're in church and you have these mountaintop experiences. Like this is what we, this is what we as a leadership team live for. We live to create a place where Holy Spirit can move, touch people, and transform lives. This is, this is what we do. Like this, we do this and we have a job. We do this and we raise our family. Like this is, this is who we are. And everything we do lines up with this, right? But what happened was it didn't stay here. It's got to go out there. They didn't stay in the upper room. It carried them, just like it carried Jesus. The Spirit carried Jesus away from that Jordan River. So many people would have just stayed. Like if, I, if the Holy Ghost lands on me like a dove, I'm staying in the Jordan. I'm not going, I'm like, no, I'm good right here. Like right here. I'll get maybe a raft and move right here, like a houseboat. Why leave this place? But the Spirit leads them, right? Spirit led them right out of that upper room. Like, like while they're there one minute, it was, just, it was just a room. And the next moment, it became a sacred place. Because the presence of God was there. And how much we want to stay in that sacred place and say, this is my church time. This is what I do in my Bible study. This is what I do so I can go and endure the world. And God is like, no, no, no. The promise of Pentecost is this anointing that is upon you. You, you carry it as you go through life, as you go out into the world. It is still on you. Pentecost is the encounter with God where the language of God is imprinted on your heart for you and a sign for others. It's imprinted on your heart for you, but it's also a sign for others. There was a time where you had to go to the temple 
to experience God. There was, there was a time where you had to go visit the priest, but as believers, we know that the spiritual clothing we receive in times of encounter with God stay with us in our everyday lives. We don't, we, don't, we, don't need to, we don't need to ask Moses to go up on the mountain and ask God what he thinks about us. We, we don't have to go and ask the priest, can you please uh, forgive me? Can you, can you please make it possible for me to be forgiven? We don't have to ask some a prophet to come and let me know, am I really still a son? Am I really still a daughter? Am I still really accepted by the Father? No, no, no. We have the Holy Spirit of God living on the inside of us who bears witness that we're children of the Most High God, that His Spirit lives in us, that we're connected connected with him eternally and one day he's coming back but still I walk with his power upon me and his presence upon me for me to experience his love and the world to experience the fact that he is alive. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on give him praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This power is not outside of you intervening. It's on the inside. It's on the inside. So with this understanding of this gift that God has given us, in full appreciation of this gift, in the full provenance, and the history, this thing that men longed for, and Hebrews talks about they live their whole life and never receive, never saw the promise, this thing that we carry. I want to ask you just, just a couple questions. And if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. And if you're not taking notes, I want you to repent and write this down. First question I want you to ask yourself this week. What has God empowered me to do? If you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and you've received His Spirit, He's empowered you. He's empowered you. Second thing I want you to ask this week, how will I be a sign to the world that Jesus is alive? How will I be a sign to the world that Jesus is alive? Jesus commissioned his disciples and he told them lots of stuff. Uh, I like good theology. I study theology. I love it. I can get bogged down in it. But Jesus didn't say, hey, get your theology right. He didn't say, hey, make sure you know the right terminology and uh, you have your uh, pneumatology correct and, uh, you know, your soteriology. Don't tell you. No, he didn't say that. Jesus actually gave them a pretty easy plan on how to be a witness, how to be a sign. Mark 16, 15, he said to them, go into all the world, preach the gospel to all creation. This is going to sound funny, but I actually believe the Bible. It's funny when you believe the Bible instead of just what everybody says about the Bible. And it doesn't say there, preach the gospel to all the people. It says to all creation. Some of y'all need to preach the gospel to your checkbook. This ain't, this ain't lining up with the gospel. My son and I planted a whole hundred feet of hedges in my backyard. And I watered and I preached the gospel to it. I prophesied over my bushes like, y'all are going to grow big, fast, and look beautiful. I'm preaching the gospel over all creation. But Jesus says here, listen, I'm going to come upon you, and you're going to tell people, watch this, what you've experienced. That is the God, that's the good news. The good news is what you have experienced in Jesus Christ. And you need to not be embarrassed about what you have experienced. You need to not be embarrassed that you don't have a theological treatise. You don't have to be embarrassed that you don't have been to Bible college and all that. People want to ask questions. Here's a, here's a, here's a, here's a perfect answer to stuff you don't know. I don't know. But I met Jesus. Well, what about the, the, the people, the Ethiopians? Yeah, I don't know. I met Jesus. And my life has changed. 
But what about them? Yeah, I don't know about that. I'm telling you what I do know about. I met Jesus. And my life is changed. I can take you to where he comes. And you can experience him yourself. Stand with me. Let me pray for you. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Shekabah. Ha. Believers, if you'll quietly pray in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. 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 Wow. Holy Spirit of God. Precious promise of Jesus. Promise of the Father. Spirit of Christ. Spirit of God. Ha. Huh. Ah, it is your promise that we will be clothed with power. Wow. Clothed with power. And I pray for your people today, Father. I pray for your people that they would walk in the power and the authority that you have given them. That they would cherish their experience with you. They would allow it to become part of who they are. Now, I just feel like right now, the Holy Spirit is beginning to come upon some of you right now. And there's a, there's a fire coming on some of your heads. Not everybody. Maybe only a couple, but I believe it's, it's, there are some. And I'm just asking Jesus for more. 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 We want to be a people filled with your power. Clothed with power. I want to pray for a few of you this morning. If you feel like, man, I need that. I want to stand in agreement with you. I want to lay hands on you and believe that God will do the same for you that he did then. Maybe you are experiencing the fire of God laying on your, landing on your head. I love to lay hands on you and pray for you. So if that's you, I want to invite you to come forward now. But Corey, why don't you come and close us out? Wow. Amen. Can we give it up for the word this morning? If that's you this morning and you would like a, a prayer, if you're experiencing that fire and you would like pastor to pray for you, just come on, come on forward and he'll pray for you. See, Jesus, he wants us, he wants us to ex- participate in the inward work. And he also wants us to participate in the outward demonstration of that work. One way we can participate in and what he wants to do in us is by things like this, answering the altar call and just saying, Lord, I'm, I'm yours can do whatever you want. The other way we can participate in the inward work is coming to our uh, our Friday night Moving Mountains series uh, this Thursday during the month of July where we're just going to allow God to come and, and heal our hearts. Amen. Amen. He wants us to go be the church. Turn your neighbor say, you ready to be the church? Let me pray for you guys and I'll dismiss you. Father, I thank you for these who are gathered here today. I just bless them. I bless what you're doing in our life. I bless you bless what you want to do through our life. And I pray that this week you give us opportunities to share our testimony. You give us opportunities to share what you are doing in our hearts, in our families, in our church. In the name of Jesus, everybody said amen, amen, amen. Give it up for Jesus one more time. God bless you guys. Have an amazing Sunday. Meet somebody you don't know before you leave today. And we'll see you next week.